Take your seats. And Mayor Verbenovich to finish Thanks. off. Thanks. Uh, if I can have someone uh, move three readings from special counsel, moved by Councillor Singh, second by Councillor Galloway Seelock. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Motion to adjourn. Councillor Marsh, Councillor uh, Janetsky. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Back over to you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Good, e good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, the public input session for the City of Kitchener's uh, 2016 budget. Uh, to start us off, we're going to hear from our Director of uh, Financial Planning, uh, Mr. Hagee. Good evening, Chair Davey and members of Council. Uh, by way of introduction, I'd just like to spend a few minutes talking about the, the way, different ways that citizen input finds its way into the budget process, uh, specifically in 2016. So as Council's aware, there are several different methods that uh, citizens can use to, during the 2016 budget. This includes for instance, tonight, having a public input night where people can direct uh, their comments right to you, uh, responding to Facebook and Twitter posts uh, by the city about the budget, written submissions, whether through traditional mail or email, phone calls or uh, communications directly with each of you. All of our budget material has been made available online, so it's accessible uh, to anyone that can get to the City of Kitchener website. And we've been uh, publicizing that the information is there every opportunity we have. For instance, Messages uh, by the city's Facebook and, and Twitter posts have reached nearly 85,000 users alone, as well as other methods of, uh, of publicizing that the information's there. Since launching in December, uh, there have been uh, over 400 unique uh, visitors to the budget website, uh, so people have been engaged in getting the information uh, off that website. As part of the 2016 budget, there were some new efforts made to educate the public uh, about the city's budget. And the most significant action this year was a short video, which Council's already seen, uh, but it helps explain at a high level how the city builds its budget. Uh, it just, uh, it's already had about 160 views, as you can see there, and I just asked the clerk to, to play it now, uh, just for everybody that's here. Okay, I'd like to help you understand how your city develops its budget. We always hear about them, and often this can feel like another language altogether. Before we get started, there is important information you should know. Ontario cities like Kitchener receive only 9% of all taxes collected, but are responsible for over 50% of the infrastructure. Let's start by looking at what the word budget means. Simply put, it's a planned, itemized summary of money that is coming into the city and how that money is spent for a specific period of time. It's very important to note that provincial government legislation in Ontario states money coming in equals money going out, also known as revenue equals expenditures, or a balanced budget. The City of Kitchener provides 47 core services to the citizens of Kitchener, so City Council and Administration always have to make difficult decisions to ensure this balancing takes place. There are two main components of the budget when looking at the money going out side of the scale. Operating pays for all the day-to-day -day activities of the corporation. This includes items such as salaries and wages, utilities, supplies, fuel, and insurance, just to name a few. The capital budget pays for all the new big investments or the rehabilitation of current assets under the city's control. So let's focus on how the city collects to pay for all these services. For every dollar that comes into the city, 31 cents comes from property taxes, 56 cents from utility rates and user fees, and 13 cents from other sources. So, now we have learned what a budget is, how cities collect money, and how they spend it. Now, let's take a look at how these pieces work together. Money comes in through property taxes, utility rates, and user fees, and other sources. The money collected is required for both the operating and capital budget. We've already talked about the operating budget, including day-to-day -day expenses, but it also includes money for funding capital budgets. The capital budget pays for all the new big investments or the rehabilitation of current assets under the city's control. This connection is made through three methods. The capital levy method reflects a pay-as-you-go approach. The reserve fund method, which reflects a planned now, acquire or use later approach. And the debt payment approach. Okay, so let's recap. One, a budget is a plan for money coming in and money going out. There are two building blocks to the city budget, operating and capital. Two, 
The operating budget is like paying your house bills to keep the lights on. Just like in a normal household, our bills go up with inflation. Three, the capital budget is like your major outlays, vehicles, house, renovations, etc. Four, money comes in from three sources, property tax levy, utility rates and user fees, and other sources. Five, money coming in is used to deliver 47 core services to city residents. Six, city council and administration, with the input of the public, decide how best to balance the city budget guided by provincial legislation. And that is how your city develops its budget. It's just a few more comments, Mr. Chair. Uh, specific to this year's budget, we've had less public feedback uh, about the 2016 budget received in advance of public input night than we've had in previous years. Uh, but all the information that we've received has been summarized in the final budget issue paper that you have, uh, BD11. Although we're seeing that the number of delegations here tonight is fairly consistent with what we've seen over the last number of years. So there does seem to be a continued interest in the budget. Uh, lastly, it just bears referencing that it, there's a substantial amount of public consultation that happens outside of the actual budget process that helps guide and direct where the budget uh, goes. This is done through on targeted issues, things like the Qantas Park Pool, uh, maybe a little more broadly, things like the Leisure Facilities Master Plan, or very broadly, things like uh, the Environic Survey or Your Kitchener, Your Say engagement. And all the feedback that comes back from that gets reflected in the budget. Uh, the feedback that we've received has helped determine priorities, as we've seen in the 2016 budget. Examples of this include the priority for community center expansions uh, that we have, uh, that council did, discussed uh, in, in depth last year, adding Wi-Fi to some city facilities, and proposed tax rate that approximates inflation and maintains city services. Looking forward to next year and beyond, we're excited for new opportunities for using an e-engagement tool that uh, we anticipate would hopefully be ready for next year's budget, as well as piloting uh, participa participatory budgeting uh, in conjunction with the neighborhood strategy. So, Mr. Chair, that closes my comments, and I'd like to turn the meeting back to you. Thank you kindly. So again, the purpose of uh, tonight's evening is to hear from, uh, hear from the people that want to, to speak to members of council regarding the budget. So you will hear very little from members of council because we want, we want to hear from you. Uh, the format of how the evening works is each of you that have signed, uh, registered as a delegate have five minutes to make your presentation. Uh, we have a brand new clock here today, which I understand you got uh, at a very low, very, very low price, which is budget related. But um, so I will, if you can try and keep your eye on that clock, we're going to see how it works. Um, if you, if you find that you're running out of time, and you still want to finish that one extra thought, please do so. Uh, I don't feel like it's a hard cut off in terms of your presentation. Um, if there are, we do have eight delegates registered. If anyone, anyone else wants to speak that's here and, and you want to speak afterwards, even though you haven't registered, I will ask if anyone else would like to speak. You can simply raise your hand and state your name and you can, you can make a presentation to council as well. Uh, so that covers it. So we will get right into it and we'll start. Uh, the first delegate of the evening is uh, Joseph Sulier, I believe is how you pronounce the name. Is Joseph here? Joseph? No? Okay, we'll keep you for later. Next up we have uh, Mr. Harold Jewitz, who I see in the gallery. And Mr. Jewitz did provide a copy of his speaking notes to council. So just Mr. Chair, just a housekeeping thing. Uh, I, the gates were down at the parking lot and also I want, needed to go to a washroom uh, before uh, 6.30 and the washrooms were locked here on this floor. Just okay. wanted to let you know. Thank you. When you're ready. Okay. So here we are again at another round of increases higher than the rate of inflation or consumer price index. The city's proposed operating tax increase is 1.5%, which is higher than the expected inflation rate for the province of Ontario by 0.3% or 25% higher than the inflation rate. In order for many of you to keep your commitment and not increasing taxes higher than the rate of inflation, you would need to cut the 2016 budget increase by at least another approximate $300,000. 
What is even more concerning is the collective increase for stormwater management system along with the water and sanitary systems. This is a collective increase of 9.3 percent or almost eight times higher than the rate of inflation. What is disturbing about this is the lack of priority you seemingly give to these problems while at the same time not taking into consideration the community's ability to pay for our infrastructure situation. The cost of water is not just going up 25 cents a day, but since 2012 it has gone up approximately 70 cents a day with the end of the increases nowhere in sight. If, if, if infrastructure is a problem, staff and councillors make it out to be, then treat it as a priority to getting this corrected and not spend unnecessarily. For example, 800,000 in just Ward 7 during 2015, 700,000 for the skateboard park and $100,000 for the uh, uh, West Heights debacle. I need to get into some detail on the water and sanitary schedules in the 2016 budget papers. I am referring to pages 010, which for the audience, by the way, I thank the, the supporters that came out tonight, is the impact to household budget, 080 and 082, which are the schedules that show the revenue and expense for water and sewage. I trust you all noticed the values for consumption of water and sanitary were changed for 2015 to better reflect actual consumption per household versus what was used for the 2015 budget. You all caught that. However, this change was not carried forward to pages 80 and 82. I suggest this also needs to take place before you finalize the 2016 budget. What is happening here is the consumption is being overstated, therefore the revenues are higher by approximately 1.5 to 2 million per year for both water and sanitary, or 15 million for the next five years. No wonder there's a shortage of funds for the necessary water and sanitary infrastructure. The other detail I'd like to point out is the gas works utility, supply and transportation. When the rate increase effective November 1, 2015 was discussed on October 19, 2015, it appears as though councillors did not have all the information necessary to make a totally informed decision. Staff advised you to decrease the rates substantially, creating a $5 million loss in the gross margin for 2016, and even worse, showing an anticipated rate increase for November 1st, 2016, of 24%. This is not what KU customers asked for a couple of years ago. I did watch you review the 2016 budget, on, budget documents by a webcast and look forward to watching your deliberations on January 18th, 2016. I will be glad to answer any questions. And by the way, Mr. Chair, I cannot see the clock. You cannot see the clock, okay, thank you for that. As I talk, I cannot see the clock. I'm just letting you know. Okay. Maybe we can move that up a little bit. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jewitz, for your presentation and for coming in this evening. Uh, yep, there's, there's, there's no questions. Thanks for coming in. No questions? No. Yeah, so council is going to be listening this evening mostly, so there will be questions of clarification mostly on the end. You know, I would time. appreciate it if the change of policy was told to people ahead of the meeting and not at the meeting. And I understand that. Part of the rationale, though, uh, Mr. Jarrett, says we don't really know how many people are going to show up to the meeting until the time of the meeting, so we have to have a reactionary sort of approach to how we deal with these This things. is not the first time that communication leaves a lot to be desired. Okay. Thank you for coming in, Mr. Jarrett. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. David Marskell from the museum. Uh, 
Hi, everybody. I can see the clock. It's a lovely clock, and I'm glad you got a good deal. Um, okay, I'm going to do this as quickly as I can. Um, thank you for your support over the years. Um, just a quick summary, the museum had a very good year ending June 30th, uh, 2015, with almost 90,000 people visiting. It uh, represented 41% increase in attendance, and our earned revenue um, grew uh, accordingly. Um, our year halfway point was December, 30, uh, December 31st this year, and we're up another 12%, which is great. We've also been very uh, good um, in terms of managing our expense lines, and you can see the decreases in, uh, in the major ones, the, the ones that we influence, other ones like hydro and so on, uh, continue to increase, and we don't influence those. Uh, just a quick update on some of the things we have coming. The Ice Age Mammals opens in two weeks, which is a collaboration with the Museum of Natural History in um, Ottawa, and we will be announcing a Terry Fox exhibit and the aging dialogues in the spring. Um, we're very pleased to be responding to the community with the creation of a makerspace, uh, the underground studio makerspace, which will be built in our um, lower level. You can see an image there of the existing space, and it's something that over the last three years has really grown, and uh, we are responding to the community. Uh, we're working very hard to collaborate with artists and in my case, the Alliance or Grand Community, which is the larger or pillar organizations. And there's a, a number of things that we're doing to work with them to uh, make it easier for artists, to become a meeting place for artists. And uh, I'm very pleased with the number of them. And I, I don't want to spend too much time because I know you've got a lot of delegations behind me. Uh, one of them, though, is, is the, uh, the map. And it's something that we're concerned about, we're keeping an eye on. I think that people will um, get used to uh, navigation and so on until the ion is actually open. Uh, but I'd like to point out when, this, when we send this out a couple of times a week that we've got the other cultural organizations uh, certainly in the area highlighted there. Um, this one, I'm sorry, is animation, so I'll just do it very quickly. But it's something that is very important to me personally that we become a stage and remain to be a, a cultural hub for lots of different groups. Um, art groups and education groups and so on. Our fifth annual brush off um, is coming up soon in January. It's, uh, it's grown over the five years and we partner now with um, Cambridge and Waterloo. Um, the KCI uh, uh, photography show is another great one. The refugee art show in June is uh, a wonderful show. Um, we've got the Eastwood Collegiate uh, show right now, which is uh, terrific. We had 100 and almost 200 people show up for the opening last Wednesday night, students and their parents. Um, so we're, we're, I'm delighted to be a stage for the many different things that we can have and bring to downtown Kitchener. The last two are uh, partnerships with the University of Waterloo. Uh, Light Illuminated, many of you have been to or came to the opening, which is great. And we also um, commission and pay artists uh, to, to help us with uh, some of our um, um, special events and ex exhibitions and so on. Um, as you hear me say every year, um, we currently receive zero operating from the City of Kitchener. Uh, the per capita fund uh, we've had for the last four or five years has not increased at all, and there is a building maintenance fund that is controlled by the City, and um, you can see some of the numbers there. I think it's in front of you. Um, and the reason I'm here tonight is that I would hope that you would consider um, increasing us something this year. It's been four or five years uh, since we've had any increase at all. We've received zero operating, and uh, based on the population growth, I'm suggesting $13,620. Thank you very, very much. You do a great job, and I'm delighted to bring lots of people to downtown Kitchener. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, uh, David. If I, just, if I could, um, if you could... Uh, Make sure uh, council gets a copy of this presentation. That would that would be appreciated. Okay. okay. Yep. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Next, uh, and it's, he's indicated he may be late, but is Craig Smith here yet? Not seeing him. We will come back. Yes, we do have a written submission as well, which. Um, Yes, yeah, so that's, we have received written submissions from him and as well as uh, Mr. William Black, who he's not um, presenting this evening, but he did send in a letter. 
Uh, next, uh, Alfred Rempel. Good evening, Mr. Rempel. Committee Chair and Councillors. This delegation includes Carrie Thorpe of Victoria Hills Community Garden, Joe Mancini of the Working Centre, and myself, Alfred Rempel, of Queen's Green Community Garden. The Working Centre represents uh, two of the community gardens, Queen's Green and May Place. And I want to recognize some of the gardeners who have joined us here tonight as well. We are here to address the new funding in the budget related to community gardens on page C4. This delegation is here to encourage council to uh, support this new funding. Queen's Green is on Queen Street across from Joseph Schneider House. This garden, because of its history and visibility, has become a model community institution. We want to create an engaging public space that encourages neighbors to work together and talk to each other in addition to the gardening. The city is intensifying and the community gardens have a, an important role to play. Community gardens help turn a large city into many smaller neighborhoods. One of the challenges for Queen's Green is to find a reliable source of water. In the past, we've used fire hydrants. Now we get our water from neighbors who allow us to access their outdoor water taps. The new funding in this budget will help us find a permanent solution to our water needs. This new funding will allow us to focus our energy on creating an attractive and sustainable garden. At this community garden, we are also growing community. Thanks for your support. Thank you very kindly for coming in. Um, I'm Carrie Thorpe, and I'm the coordinator of the Victoria Hills Community Garden. Uh, the garden was established almost 25 years ago uh, in the high density neighborhood of Victoria Hills, and it was established by the Safer Communities Initiative. It's a, a very successful and a thriving garden, and it's really appreciated by the mainly first-generation immigrant families who live nearby and who garden our 26 large plots. Um, in past years, we've had access to water from a local uh, neighbor, from a nearby neighbor, whose uh, summer water use was subsidized by Kitchener Utilities, and I understand that this program is, is being terminated. Uh, so we've we're very careful with our water use. We only let our gardeners water every other day and uh, uh, we limit water during drought. Um, so our hope is that some of the funding that you're considering providing for community gardens will be used to provide Victoria Hills Garden uh, with an in-ground permanent faucet that will allow us to continue to, um, to thrive. So, and I just thank Council so much for all of your support for community gardens. It means a lot to us. Thanks. Thank you. I can see the clock, but it's not working. Uh, yeah, I, I, tur I didn't realize that the three of you wanted to speak, so I just turned it off because oh, you could have registered individually. Oh, we're going to go so. fast. We have it right down. Okay, uh, back in 1997, almost 20 years ago, prodded by the Working Centre, the City of Kitchener helped support the establishment of the Queen's Green Community Garden by offering gardeners long-term access to this floodplain property next to Snyder's Creek Gardeners have turned this vacant land into a thriving, thriving neighborhood place. At almost zero cost to the city, a unique community space has taken root. Gardeners make this place, but so do amenities like the shed and the bake oven, uh, the fence, the common table. These common tools create a pride of place commitment to their garden. So the city offering um, to hook up water is really a crucial infrastructure. It's a great idea. Um, really forward thinking on your part, and we really hope that you'll follow through on it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all kind kindly for coming in today. Okay, uh, next is uh, Danielle, I think it says DeVoe um, from Cherry Park Neighborhood Association. Thank you, and I'm also here on behalf of a community garden, Willow Green Community Garden, which operates under Cherry Park Neighborhood Association. Um, we also have a water problem. Um, one of our sites, uh, the original Willow Green Garden, has until recently also had the Kitchener uh, Utilities um, 
water provision uh, and with that being cancelled um, we don't really have a way to pay for water at at the site um, we so we are seeking to have um, an agreement put in place whereby we can continue to draw water from a neighbor's house and have that that money reimbursed um, somehow in the garden's budget um, we also have an additional garden site. We extended our garden into unused land. Um, the original garden is on Cherry, uh, Cherry Street. Uh, the extension is further back along the creek, and uh, that space was previously um, a somewhat problematic space. It was used for illegal camping. Um, it had a lot of problems with litter um, and fires, so we've moved an additional garden into that space. We currently do not have any water provision for that site. Um, so a majority of gardeners draw water from the stream, which is not ideal. Um, one of the commitments that Willow Green Garden has made is to make gardening accessible to all citizens. Uh, we do that in our original garden by having raised beds um, that have paving around them, and they are wheelchair and reduced uh, uh, mobility accessible. Um, at the secondary site, um, it is not wheelchair accessible, but we do still um, have um, accessibility uh, accommodations that we can make. For example, one of our gardeners is vision impaired. He uh, cannot go down to the stream to draw water. In his case, he lives adjacent to the garden, and he brings water from his own kitchen tap to water his garden plot. But we obviously wouldn't be able to accommodate um, most people um, in that way if they happen to not live nearby. So not having a, an accessible uh, water supply actually prevents us from meeting one of our mandates as a community garden, which is to be accessible to, um, to, all, committee, to, to all community members. So we are seeking to have um, water provided um, through an operations budget um, reimbursed. We have residents at both sites who are willing to continue to supply water to tanks that we have on site, um, but only if we can have um, that, that cost reimbursed. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, for coming in. Uh, next, we have uh, Doug Fuhrer from the Community Homes Group. Hello. Good evening. I want to thank the council and the honorable mayor for hearing us. I'm going to cut in my time a little bit to oh. um, suggest that the request for this community garden is almost a no-brainer. With the size of the budget and what they're requesting, I hope it's uh, an automatic approval for the request. It's an awesome cause. Community Homes Group is a, um, a non-profit affordable housing builder and developer. And uh, although this part of what I'm requesting is not currently in the budget, there's a potential for it. And obviously, council and the staff have talked about incentives for affordable housing. I want to briefly talk about uh, the 2014 development charges background report that was produced for the uh, staff consultation report by Hempson. Uh, how do I say this? Um, Affordable housing, definitions. There's um, obviously there's concern for solving the homelessness issue, which has been dealt with by the region rather effectively. And there is the issue of new stock. And obviously there are concerns amongst the staff that, or the council that also is a regional issue. And obviously the region has uh, developed an investment in affordable housing program. However, I'm going to suggest to this council that under the development charges program, the city could probably do more in terms of dealing with a market that's not dealt with. We spent a lot of time as a society talking about the homelessness issue and dealing with the population at most risk in terms of mental health issues and addiction and we've spent a great deal of time effectively in terms of economic development, in terms of the redevelopment of the downtown, and in terms of bringing in 
uh, economic development, dealing with Google, dealing with the infrastructure downtown that's required for that servicing that kind of area, LRT. As, as a city, we're doing a good job on that. However, I'm going to suggest, and I have been in discussions with the region on this, I'm going to suggest that there is a little bit of a lack in terms of dealing with new stock for what I consider an affordable housing market that's not being dealt with. I've been in the development business a long time, so I've seen the entire spectrum. And I have some concerns that as a society we're not dealing with, uh, we're, we're catering to this end and this end, and not necessarily the folks in this community that are, you know, uh, how do I say this? Working moms, divorced dads, aging seniors, people in this community that have worked here forever and aren't going to be getting a top job at Google and all of a sudden are being priced out of the market that can't come up with $1,200 or plus every month for a senior's apartment or two bedroom apartment or you know where does divorced dad go where does mom go when, when there's a huge segment of our population that is caught in the middle in, in terms of our different in terms of how we deal with the definition of affordable housing so for me I'm, I'm, I'm making I'm urging the council to consider in the development charges uh, program considering setting aside funding not just under the setting aside property taxes, but actually as an investment. You know, $25,000 a unit, 100 units a year, two and a half million dollars, three years, not as a gift, not as a grant, not an IHA grant, but a pure investment, an investment that has, where the return comes through after a number of years, there's a return on investment, 3%. The city is capable of, of, of accessing money at a low rate, so I think when you go to taxpayers and say, we're going to do invest affordable housing, it's not a gift, it's an investment where the developer or the nonprofit group actually has to pay it back. And that is circulated. It's like the Economic Development Fund, only it's for community housing. So I think we need to change the definition of affordable housing and call it community housing, where that project not only goes from the person at the highest risk to the senior and everyone in between, but all at the same time we provide supportive care in the same project. We, we team up with KW Health Links, Community Wards, Center for Mind Medicine. We team up with those people. We team up with Waterloo Regional Homes for Mental Health. We team up with the Y. And we have a truly mixed community. So I want to urge the council, it may be too late for this budget, but I think the council has to look at not just grants, but an investment in affordable housing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Candy, for coming in. Uh, next, we have uh, Keith Kennel. Okay, thank you kindly. Okay, we'll st we'll look back at see if anyone's uh, shown up. Uh, is, has Joseph? Uh, I think it's uh, Soulier or Soulier arrived yet? Not seeing. Uh, Craig Smith. Is Craig Smith here? Okay. Uh, as those people aren't there, now I would actually like to ask anyone who would like to address council, if you would like to, just simply raise your hand, and uh, you can come down and speak if you like. Is there anyone here today that would like to address members of council? Yes, sir. Please. If you could just state your name, sir, and then you can My have... name is Tom Malazzi, and... Um... I just moved here about a year and a half ago, oh, the clock's on, um, about a year and a half ago from Richmond Hill and um, really enjoy Kitchener. It's a terrific community. It's um, People are friendly and there's not too much traffic in comparison to the GTA. Um, the, um, so we're, we're happy to live here. My daughter goes to Waterloo. Um, I guess really the concern I'm, I'm bringing forward is the amount of um, property taxes that I pay. Um, I understand that the average in Kitchener is amongst the lowest uh, in the province and I've seen, visited the website and seen the information and the data. The way I look at it is um, I pay about $9,300 in taxes. Um, yes, I live in a more expensive house. 
Um, it's not expensive in comparison to where I came from in Richmond Hill. In fact, it's a lot less expensive. But the rate per thousand here, I guess, is really the issue. The rate per thousand that I had in um, Richmond Hill was uh, 0.83. The rate per thousand in Kitchener is 1.18, which is significantly higher. Okay, we can look at the values of the homes. The values of the home in the area are uh, a lot less than the GTA, so um, as a result, people are paying less taxes. But if, you're, if the value of your home is slightly skewed to the higher end, you're paying one heck of a lot more taxes. And uh, the most I've ever paid living in Brampton, Richmond Hill, uh, Oakville, etc., etc., is around $5,800 for the same value of home, but I'm paying 9,300, and it'll probably be about 95 or 9,600 in 2016. Um, yeah, I live in a more, uh, you know, in a, in a more valuable home. Um, I don't see a lot of tears here for that, but uh, at the end of the day, we still have to pay it, and it's a lot of money. And uh, my monthly bill is about 750 a month, which, to most people, that would be another mortgage. But um, anyway, thanks for listening. Thank you for coming in. Is there anyone else that would like to address council? Technically committee, but don't be shy. It's okay. We'd love to hear from you. I guarantee you every single member of uh, committee would love if you would come down and speak. Okay, I am not seeing any. With that, I get that would I, I, that would conclude the uh, all the delegates that we have. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Kennel and Mr. Suye uh, did not attend, um, so I would ask staff if they could uh, connect with them and maybe um, forward any thoughts via email. Uh, but again, thanks everyone for coming in this evening. Uh, this is this does not end the feedback you can provide to a committee. Please feel free to contact your member of council and provide any feedback that, any feedback that you wish, and we're only too happy to listen. Okay. Thank you and have a good evening and travel safe.